Uh, my name is Torin. I'll be a facilitator of this book club. This is my third book club with this community. I did advanced R and R packages. Um, and I live in Texas. I'm a professor at Texas A&M Statistics. Um, so, Ron, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, my name is Ron Legier. I'm a kind of on my own now. I have my own company, do technical consulting on machine learning and model building of various kinds. Um, I have participated in several book clubs so far. Um, I was actually at one point doing too many book clubs at one time, so I had to take a step back on that, uh, especially when some of my uh, contracts started heating up a little bit. I had one contract that started late, so I'm trying to make up for lost time as it were. And so I'm really excited about this. This is actually quite relevant to some of the stuff I'm doing, and I'm hoping to actually use Julia in my uh, in this new project to take advantage of its ability to do differential equations more than anything else. But um, so yeah, I'm really I'm, I'm, I really appreciate that you volunteered to lead this cohort. Originally, I had signed up for it and had to back out, but uh, because of time constraints, but I do still hope still hope to uh, participate uh, in the book club. Time for reading. Oh, Hi, Andrew. actually. Oh, Sean, go ahead. Yeah, so. Oh, uh, okay. So I I am part of two book clubs, I should say, from the tidyverse tidyverse documentation, and uh, the statistics one, and then this one. So my background is actually in engineering, particularly in civil engineering. And I am doing PhD, so I thought, why not? This book can be helpful for me in my numerical calculations and those kind of things. So that's why I'm here. Hi, my name is Andrew, and I'm currently based in China. I do research, teaching research here. Um, I am I participate in another book club that is. We're running in the same time as um as this book club at least every every week as well uh, uh and uh i i wanted to use this opportunity to learn more about julia as i never used it before uh and uh, some of the topics in the book are probably going to be very new to me as well but uh it's, it would be nice to learn some new stuff all right great um, okay, so I'll share my screen. Um, and then I guess Okay, so we're gonna talk about just chapter one today, and I also have some stuff from the preface for the Julia version. So from the preface, they talk about pros and cons of Julia versus MATLAB. Um, and then sort of the content was uh, some mathematical definitions, including floating point numbers, accuracy, condition numbers, um, algorithms, writing functions in Julia, and then measuring algorithm stability. And yeah, so I'm a trained statistician, so I'm not a computer scientist. So when we get to some of the um, Definitions. These are actually the first time I've probably seen them. Um, okay, so from the uh, preface, they kind of gave a history of um, numerical computation. And so they said MATLAB kind of was the first uh, software on the scene. And then came SciPy, NumPy, and Matplotlib, which offered sort of a free, open, and integrated alternative to MATLAB. Um, and then sort of now this newcomer, Julia, um, and they described Julia as a solution to sort of the performance deficiency seen in MATLAB and Python, um, but that it also can have all of the benefits of these two since they're kind of learning from those two software's mistakes. Um, so why learn Julia over MATLAB? Um, one thing, so these are the from the authors, their benefits. So we can type Unicode, Unicode characters um, so we can have object names that look like math. You can have uh, effortless functions to find in scripts. Um, you can have broadcast syntax for element-wise apply. 
Um, I'm not sure what comprehension is yet, but I'm, they'll probably discuss it later. <laughs> um, easy to define keyword and optional functional arguments. Um, it's actually right part of Jupyter Notebooks. It's the JU part of Jupyter Notebooks. It's free and open source and the skills that you learn from learning Julia are more likely to transfer, I'm guessing, to other programming languages is probably what they mean there. Um, Trade-offs for using Julia and not MATLAB is, um, Julia is stricter and more verbose, which can be more error prone, um, but it, it can make the results easier to predict. Uh, so you can um, get outputs that you expect. There's more installation effort. Um, so I wanted to actually ask if everyone was able to install Julia and the book package. Okay. No, I haven't started. Is there any okay. instruction in the channel?H, uh, it's in the book. Okay. So okay, if we'll you check. click the the link book, um, it's I believe. I um, think it's in the in the main text. I think. Yeah, I think it's in the intro. Maybe. There it is. Oh yeah, so right here in the intro, um, I can put. Okay. This it's pretty straightforward. You just, it's like two steps or something. Well, you have to install Julia, which follows instructions, and you just execute that that command, and you're done. <laughs> yeah. I've got a bunch of warnings, but so far, it hasn't. Yeah, I got a bunch of warnings, too. <laughs> it's worth those. anything. <laughs> <laughs> I was able to install that, too. Uh, just follow the instructions there, and it should be OK. Uh, yeah. It just takes, it might take time for some. Yeah, yeah mine took you, several minutes. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next point then is that this is a new language. So there, the documentation and content online are slimmer than what you might be used to, um, maybe for R, Python, or MATLAB. Uh, that, and they said there's not a good companion desktop. Um, IDE and debugger. And so this sort of installation effort comes down to Julia is a just-in-time compilation language. Uh, and so it may require noticeable time to load uh, for the first time. But if you don't make any changes, then you probably won't notice anything. All right. And then, so what to expect from this book? So their kind of goal is to exhibit a decent style of programming in Julia so that we can avoid our bad programming habits. They make this mention that although there is some indexing from zero in Julia, they're only going to use everything um, from index one. There are lots of plotting packages, but they're only going to use this specific one plots. Um, and they're going to not really get into sort of the bigger or wait, no, sorry, they are going to get into packages uh, so for some real applications, but, but they will not cover a defining feature of Julia, which I am unfamiliar with anyway, which is multiple dispatch. So I guess this is one um, feature that makes Julia a star and they're not gonna cover it. All right, so that's the preface. So let's get into um, uh, definitions essentially. So chapter one was, a lot of definitions. So we, they are defined condition number, which is a, a number or quantity that describes the sensitivity of an operation to error and finite precision, um, where a larger condition number indicates more sensitivity. And then they uh, define this adjective for algorithm. An algorithm is unstable if it allows for errors in numerical computation to grow enormously. And we'll get into more details on this. Uh, Looks like I got forgot a um, dollar sign here. <laughs> so um, let's define floating point numbers. So a floating point number is a set of numbers defined in this way. So we have plus or minus one plus f times two to the n. 
where n is some integer, well, this is called the exponent, and then this part, 1 plus f, is called the mantitha or the significant, when this f is a finite sum of d uh, binary numbers. Okay, so d is called the binary precision. Okay, if we convert this f to a form in base 10 rather than base 2, um, you get sort of the scientific notation where you have some initial point B0, a sum of the uh, base 10 numbers times 10 to the n. Okay, so we see from this that um, for a specific D, this floating point number will have D plus one uh, significant digits. Um, and this is just a very formal way that they, and the main takeaway from this is that this is how computers represent numbers and it's finite. It's a finite sum, right? So we have finite precision when we do machine uh, calculations and that precision um, can be expressed in terms of this quantity, the machine epsilon. So the machine epsilon is bit two to the, minus d, right? So this is from the definition of the floating point, right? Where d kind of gives you um, the number of significant digits. And this is the um, smallest floating point number that is greater than one. It's not a universal bound on error for every number. And that's something that they kind of stress in this chapter. It just gives a bound on relative error of rounding a real number to the nearest float. And that error is um, variable depending on the actual magnitude of um, that number. Okay, so here's some more definitions. So we have precision, floating point numbers always have D binary digits, but the resolution um, is bounded by machine epsilon. So this is uh, kind of, where they wanted to stress the difference between um, how many digits a number will have and how much error there is. Um, and then we they go through these accuracy measures. So I kind of changed a little bit from the book, but essentially, right, if we take a number X and we have some approximation of X, maybe that's the nearest floating point number on um, the absolute accuracy is just the absolute deviation. The relative accuracy is the absolute deviation divided by the true absolute value. And then we can get um, an approximation of, I guess this isn't really an approximation. We can quantify the number of accurate digits of that approximation, say expression as a floating point number um, from this expression here. So essentially minus log 10 of the relative accuracy. And feel free uh, to stop me at any time. Um, okay, so then they have this demo that I can, from Julia, right? So, uh, it's classic approximation in math is that 22 over seven is an approximation to pi, um, which is 3.1428. Um, and let me see. Okay. This is how we get the, uh, let me copy this. Let me just copy paste it. Oh, sorry. Oh. Okay. Sorry. Like I said, I'm using a some different setup that my boyfriend wanted me to. <laughs> Okay, so if we take the um, Julia constant for pi, we have this. Okay, so the accuracy is the absolute value of p minus pi. And so when you type in um, the Unicode characters in Julia, you're, you're going to use backslashes and tabs. It's kind of like math, uh, just typing in math. Um, 
Okay, so the accuracy is, you know, 0 0.0012. And then the um, relative accuracy, right, is the accuracy divided by the truth. So the relative accuracy is scaled by the magnitude of the original value is 0 0.004. Okay. Okay. And I'm just using Julia and Terminal. I know some people use um, text editors, but I'm not that far along yet. Okay. So that's just a generic definition for floating point numbers. Double precision, which most computers use, or most, sorry, I'm probably saying something wrong. I don't know if it's the computer or the language, but <laughs> um, double precision, which is kind of a standard in computing, is 64 binary bits. So that exponent D, uh, um, is 64. So we have a 52-bit significant and an 11-bit exponent. Or sorry, okay, 52 is the D. I'm sorry, I messed up and 11 bits on the exponent. So our ep machine epsilon is two to the minus 52, which is approximately 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 16, which I know in R, I see you see this number all the time when you're sort of getting close to zero, right? So this is the first floating point number. Uh, I'm gonna say something wrong. Anyway, so yeah, the machine epsilon for double precision is this number. Um, and this did not, this is my, my uh, formatting is a little off here. Okay, so what does this mean? This means we roughly have about 16 decimal digits um, for numbers. And this is not places, right? So this is digits even in scientific notation, right? So if you had a scientific notation, um, your uh, exponent can be anything. Well, not anything, but it limits the ranges of exponents um, per scientific notation between minus 1022 and 1023, right? So for a number you can, in scientific notation, you can have up to six, 16 decimal digits and you can have the scientific notation um, exponent between these two numbers. Okay, so it doesn't mean that we can only have uh, 16 the 16 decimal, uh, decimal places numbers. Um, okay, so using this exponent bounds, that means that on the computer or in the software, um, you can't have a number greater than two times 10 to the 308. If your calculation gives you this number, this is called overflow and you get an infinite, you return an infinite. Underflow, um, so if you have a number less than whatever corresponds to so this exponent, might. Uh, results in a zero. And then not a number is a result of undefined arithmetic operations such as divide by zero. Okay, and so we can get all of these um, pieces of a floating point number with these relative ju uh, related Julia functions, sine, exponent, significant, and bit string. Okay, so we can look at these. Uh, um, you can see all of the bits of a number. Uh, you can see the sign. Um, just one, the exponent. And the um, significant, I believe is what I said. Okay, so you can use all of these um, in Julia. And um, so I'm most proficient in R. So some of these things I know might be because it's different in R. Uh, so Julia doesn't allow indexing by type float. Um, so if you have a vector and they create vectors in square brackets, right? I can't index by float 1.0. You get this error um, 
where in R, I don't think it's not as surly as the, I mean, integer isn't really a thing that we use in R. <laughs> it's kind of always a converted to a float. Um, if you force coercion, I'm noticing all these mistakes in here. <laughs> but if you force coercion of non-integer floats to integers, um, you'll get an error. And I actually, I don't know what the, what maybe int. I'm not actually sure what the coercion. Maybe capital I, not sure though. Capital R. Is it like this? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you try to coerce anything that's not, doesn't look like an integer, then you get an error. Okay. Okay. So that's kind of the setup of what's floating point numbers. How do we measure um, the approximation error of converting a number to its floating point? Okay. So floating point arithmetic then, right, is machines do arithmetic with floating point numbers and they return floating point numbers. The elementary machine arithmetic operations like plus, minus, divide, multiply, um, results in relative error bounded by a machine epsilon. Um, sometimes though, this leads to disturbing results. Uh, so there's an example in the book where they show that associativity of addition breaks down um, and we can go through that. Basically, what we should observe is that with floating point points, we should not expect two mathematically equivalent results to be equal, but only relatively close. And so the example that they had was, um, let me actually go in the book. So I can find it. was, okay, let me copy this. So if we define um, this arithmetic between one plus machine epsilon minus one, so I'm gonna, so I have my machine epsilon, you can get it through this epsilon function divided by two, right? So this is 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 16 divided by two. If I have one plus machine epsilon minus one, uh, this uh, gives us zero, but if I change, if I do it um, one, oh, sorry, the change the associativity, yeah. Just change the parentheses, right? So I have E minus one, then I get uh, my E back. So this breaks, right, associativity. So these are not exact equal, but these values 0 and 1.1 to the minus 16 are relatively close. So that's what that observation is saying. We can't expect them to be exactly equal, but we can expect that they're relatively close. Okay. One of the problems with uh, doing floating point arithmetic is this, what they define as subtractive cancellation. And this is the loss of accuracy when two numbers that add or subtract to a result much smaller in magnitude. And so the original number of digits, so if you think about scientific, you know, significant digits, um, the original number become meaningless. Uh, so, for example, you have a bunch of trailing zeros, or and then those zeros are meaningless, really. And this property, subtractive cancellation, it is um, agnostic to the algorithm or the machine. It is a problem of the problem, right? So that we are subtracting two numbers where the difference is on a different magnitude. Okay. Okay, so let's formally define our condition number. Okay, so this is sort of the math they show. So our condition number, we're gonna define as kappa for some operation f, some function f. Okay, is this limit? 
and this is actually the relative um, condition number, but it's the limit as our um, error goes to zero. And we see here that it is um, proportional to the gradient of that uh, change. Okay, so this says that the, um, a couple of things, the relative error of the output, which is f of x, um, to the relative error of the input x, and then sort of times the gradient, so the magnitude of the change. And again, this condition number, this is not a property of a machine or an algorithm, it's a property of whatever f is. So if it's subtraction, addition, multiplication. Okay, so here are some specific examples. So we have the condition number of um, the function x minus a constant, right? So we have the input x, the output is x minus c, the, the derivative is one. So we can see here that the condition number um, of adding a constant is relative, right? It has this magnitude of change. So this can be really big if, um, you know, if we keep x fixed, if c is really, really small, right, or and so on. But, uh, um, okay. For multiplication by a constant, so you have x times c, the condition number is 1. This means that there's no potential for the cancellation error, the subtracted cancellation. Okay. Um, then we have another definition that's ill-conditioned. That means the you have a problem with a large relative condition number. Okay, if a relative condition number is less than one in practice, that's no different than equivalent to one. And you can see the t uh, book for a table, they go through a bunch of common like uh, sine, cosine, tangent. And they go through and have all the condition numbers. Okay, so, um, this is a condition number for one, one operation F. Um, okay. And if we think about a root finding problem, so if we define some polynomial, the roots of polynomials are ill-conditioned, meaning that they have a large right, relative condition number with respect to changes in the polynomial co coefficients. Okay, so... Um, Yeah. Um, and then let's see. For polynomial root finding, the condition number can be arbitrarily large. And there is examples of repeated roots. So if you have uh, multiple roots with multiplicity greater than one, um, that should say roots, uh, that function has an infinite condition number, which essentially means you'll have a lot of um, error. Okay. And then, yeah, there was another Julia demo and I had some notes here for that one. This was like a little bit dense, so I apologize. Okay, let's see. Okay, so this was a demo. Um, we define our um, coefficients of our polynomial to be one third and minus two thirds with this minus epsilon here. Okay. And then we're using the quadratic formula to solve for the roots. And this problem has a multiplicity roots one with multiplicity two, and we can see that we lose some accuracy with this function f. Okay, our relative error is 1.78, um, which is proportional to our machine epsilon. And I wanted to point out uh, what I noticed in this code compared to r is here, Right, we have a number times a, a scalar, and in R, if we didn't put a 
times it would it would error it would be like i don't know what you're talking about so i thought that was um a contrast to that language that i put here so we don't need to explicitly use that multiplication operator um for a like a number times a constant and you can have multiple outputs defined. So here on this line, I'll just copy it over here. We are defining um, separate, right? Objects A, B, C, all in this one line. Um, yeah. All right. Okay, so talked a little bit about um, the operations, like basic elementary operations, but then when we start getting into um, algorithms, right, this is a complete set of instructions for transforming data into a result. So essentially you're just going to compose um, a bunch of those operations. And oftentimes, right, we work with pseudocode where we write down a mixture of math words and computer style instructions, you know, in your notebook, on your text editor, wherever you, wherever you like. Uh, and for the root finding problem, different algorithms have different uh, condition numbers. So here was a function they defined for this Horner's algorithm. This is a, um, I'm sorry, not for the root finding, just simply calculating the polynomial. Um, this is a algorithm for calculating the value of a polynomial function that has coefficient c and a value x. Okay, and what it does is essentially composes um, from the, yeah, it's harder to read in the code. But instead of just calculating all of the polynomials of x, like x, x squared, x cubed up to uh, whatever uh, degree of polynomial I have, it kind of composes it into uh, smaller nested computations that have less multiplication and less addition, as I mentioned in the book. And so this is um, what a function code looks like in Julia. Okay, so some comments on this, uh, right? So we have square brackets accessing the elements of a vector C. Here, um, we're assuming the first index is zero. So n is gonna give us the last element of the vector C. Return um, is an explicit termination of the function, but the book mentions that this style is discouraged, although it hasn't given us really an alternative yet, I guess just not typing return. Um, and of course, this is a well-known. I think they meant multiple. I think they meant multiple Sorry. returns. Uh, In the book, I think they're just saying that having you, you can have multiple returns, but that style is discouraged. Okay. Okay. That's how I read it. Okay. okay good to know. Um. And yeah, so the book is using this as a demo to teach us about condition numbers. Etc. So, this is a well known problem, and there will be faster implementations in the specific packages. So, this one is polynomial. All right. So, then they go in a little bit more specifically on writing your own Julia functions. So, we can def put those function definitions in a .jl file. We can just enter it on command line, or we can use um, Jupyter Notebooks. And scoping is is that as expected, right? So if you define something in the body of a function, you can't use it uh, at a higher up, you know, scope, but you can use um, objects in the function that are defined at a higher uh, level. Okay. There are multiple ways to define a function. So the verbose way that we just saw with the Horner's algorithm, you start by putting the keyword function the name of the function, parentheses, the arguments, 
Um, and is a keyword to end the function body if there's no return, if it, if it doesn't um, get to a return statement. There's a, you can compactly define functions like this. So you have the function name and the arguments equals, and then this is the body of your function on the right. And then anonymous or lambda functions are defined with this arrow. Okay, so this, this is the input goes into this anonymous function on the right. This is the function body. Okay. And again, I'm um, sure sounds like everyone has lots of programming experience, right? So the anonymous function, right? You can't use it. Uh, you can't call it later. All right. Okay. So I mentioned this before, how we can describe an algorithm as unstable. And this is when an algorithm um, has error that exceeds error expected from the conditioning. So we saw in the polynomial roots problem, uh, we saw the quadratic formula for that specific example. So the quadratic formula is actually unstable in finite precision com computation. And the sensitivity of the quadratic of a problem or a step in an algorithm is governed by the condition number, um, but the sensitivity of an algorithm in totality from start to finish depends on the condition numbers of every individual part. Okay, so essentially it's multiplication of all the condition numbers. And I have lots of typos, I'm sorry. Okay, and we have another definition here, backward error. This is measuring of a change in original data that reproduces the result of the algorithm. And so this is the formula I give. So they say if X is some output of an algorithm, that's sort of an approximation of the data, true data X, right? So we have this sort of relative, this absolute deviance divided by the original. And I thought this picture was a little bit better. So this is our original data X apply some function and we get this output y. Okay, this is sort of um, without any, this is sort of infinite precision here. What happens though, right, is we have some um, f tilde of x because of our, to our um, finite precision computation and we get y tilde. Right, so y, the difference between y and y tilde we call error. If we then um, have this transformation of x tilde, f of x tilde gives us y tilde, this is the backward error. So it's the difference on this side between these x, x's. And they gave it an example of um, if you do a root finding problem forward, you get the root, which would be y, and then you find the coefficient, or sorry, which would be y tilde, which is have some error, then you get the coefficient of the polynomial that would give you y tilde, that would be x tilde, and, and there wouldn't be, let me show you, actually, it doesn't give you exactly right, the same numbers you started with, so that's in this one. Okay, so we construct a polynomial, um, we give it the roots we want, then we get the coefficients, 36. So these are actually our x's. The coefficients, it's, it's a little bit confusing how they do it. Okay, and then they get the roots here, and you can see there's some um, error between r and r tilde. Okay, but if we get the coefficients that gave us those approximated roots, this is our x tilde. And so you see these coefficients here are not exactly the same as what we started with 36. So that's what it's meant by backward error. So the difference, the absolute deviation relative to this magnitude um, 
is the difference between the coefficients. And you can see all the error, the backwards error here. Oh, pretty small numbers. Um, okay. Okay, and that's kind of the content of this chapter. Are there any questions? I know this is a little bit outside of my what I know. <laughs> so um not really open to any discussion, clarification. I felt the chapter was interesting. These are, I mean, I've been doing some kinds of numerical computation for a long time, but I've never looked in that detail at, the, <laughs> at these kinds of things yeah. before. So it's very illuminating to me. I've often heard people talk about, oh, it's got bad condition. I'm like, okay, I guess it's bad. I don't know. <laughs> <But that means exactly. laughs> so it's yeah. kind of nice to see that. Um, yeah, exactly. I agree. So I guess it was necessary to get that stuff out of the way so we can understand the rest of the, uh, the book. But, um, did you want to talk at all about the organization of the book club and like how people sign yeah, yeah. up and all the rest of that stuff? Yeah, so that was chapter one. So everyone, I think, mentioned that they were were another book club. So to be oh, familiar right. with format. So we have our, I'll put in the chat. Um, actually, I guess I can end the recording now because this is just...